chapter number one, we got up through uh, the announcement of Jesus' birth, the announcement of Joel, the John the Baptist's birth, then the announcement of Jesus' birth. Uh, we spent a little bit of time prefacing the book of Luke, but also now we get to the actual birth. Let me remind you that Gabriel came to Elizabeth and to Zechariah, well, came to Zechariah, that is, there in the temple where he was offering his incense, told him he was going to have a son there in their old age, and uh, he did not believe it. He struggled with his faith on that particular one, and because of his lack of faith, uh, the angel took away his ability to speak for the time being. He says, until uh, your son is born, you will not be able to speak. And so now we get to the birth. But here's the thing. Uh, there's a little bit of an issue with the name of the child, uh, because in Hebrew, um, uh, I guess the, the way they would typically operate, can't come up with the right word I want right now, uh, they would name their son after the father. Uh, the firstborn son would take on the father's name, which would mean that this son should be named Zechariah, but is he going to be? Well, let's look at Luke 1, beginning in verse number 57, and then we will read up uh, through verse number 80, I believe. Verse 57 says this, Now Elizabeth's full time came, that she should be delivered, and she brought forth a son. And her neighbors and her cousins heard how the Lord had showed great mercy upon her, and they rejoiced with her. And it came to pass that on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, and they called his name Zacharias after the name of his father. And his mother answered and said, Not so, but he shall be called John. And they said unto her, There is none of thy kindred that is called by this name. And they made signs to his father how he would have him called. And he asked for a writing table and wrote, saying, His name is John. And they marveled all. They stood there, Huh, why would you do that? And verse number 64, And his mouth was opened immediately, and his tongue loosed. And I want us to look at what he begins to say here. It says, He spake and praised God. What does he say? Verse 65, and fear came on all that dwelt round about them, and all these sayings were noised abroad throughout all the country of Judea, and all they that heard them laid up in their hearts, saying, What manner of child shall this be? And the hand of the Lord was with him. And the father and his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, So what does he say? Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people and hath raised up an horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he sware to our father Abraham, that he would grant unto us that we, being delivered out of the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of, sal of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins, through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, and was in deserts till the day of his showing unto Israel. In the earlier chapter, we saw how the angel Gabriel prophesied to Zacharias and Elizabeth that they would have a son there in their old age, and that they were to name him John, of course, Prior to um, these events occurring, Zechariah struggled with his faith, and his ability to speak was taken from him. But long even before that, it was prophesied that he would come. Back in the prophet of Malachi, and we talked about this already in previous lessons in the book of Luke, about how Malachi prophesied that there would be one whose voice would cry in the wilderness, preparing the way of the Lord. John was finally born here. The neighbors, they all came together to rejoice with them. It's possible even that Mary was there. Being present for John's birth, I don't know. I mean, it was 100 miles, I believe. So, but it's possible that she was there. Even though Elizabeth was an older lady, God still allowed there to be joy here. And as we learn about the events surrounding the birth of John the Baptist, he is the forerunner. Let us discover several truths here. Number one, one of the truths here is as we talk about 
uh, the arrival of John the Baptist, I want to look specifically at some points concerning the arrival of John the Baptist. Look at the dedication of the baby. In verse number 50, 59, it says, And it came to pass that on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, and they called his name Zacharias, after the name of his father. Uh, circumcision was the mark of God's covenant. It had been uh, given to them. Uh, it was something that they were supposed to do. It was a father's responsibility to do on the eighth day, a ceremony that he was to bring him in to have him circumcised. And so here comes the baby on the eighth day. It says back in Genesis 17, 12, it says, And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generations, he that is born in the house or bought with money of any uh, stranger which is not of thy seed. He that is born in thy house and he that is bought with thy money must needs be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man, uh, man child, whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. And so the dedication of the baby comes at this particular time, eight days in, time for the circumcision. It is time, in a sense here, also to name the child. And they said, here, as their custom was, that was the word I was trying to come up with earlier, as their custom was, it was to name that child Zacharias. Nobody seemed to have had any thought otherwise that they would name him anything other than Zacharias. And so they said, and you know, here we have the child Zacharias, and you can see mom standing off to the side. No, wait, uh, um, it's not Zacharias, actually, it's John. <laughs> and then a few people are like, oh, John? But there's nobody in your family named John. Why would you do that? I joke with Rachel about wanting to name one of our kids Ambrose, even though it does not start with a C, but it's an old family name. Uh, starting, you know, going back into the 1500s in England and coming even into the Americas, uh, Ambrose Lipscomb fought in the... Um, Revolutionary War and the War of 1812, and uh, he's kind of a forefather in a sense of uh, the Lipscombs in America. And so I, I like to, to keep that in memory. I'll probably never get to, name, to use the name Ambrose. So Colton, I'm dependent on you, buddy. You got to name one of your kids Ambrose, all right? Uh, or, or any of the other kids. I need an Ambrose. Bring, revive, you know, the, the ancestral name of our family. Uh, but it'll probably never happen. Uh, and we look at names that we use now. People name their children for different things. They name their children after people. Uh, they name their, in their family, you know, uh, naming you know, after the father or naming after the grandfather. And we've been doing that with middle names. We use middle names of previous family members, of you know, mothers, fathers, grandparents, things like that. Uh, some uh, choose only biblical names. Some choose names, um, well... You know, like the Indians, uh, they would choose a name based upon one of the first things they saw after the child was born, like running bear or, um, I don't know, croaking pigeon or something. <laughs> and, that, and they would have all kinds of strange names, you know, for uh, their children. And we choose different way, reasons, you know, to name our children in different ways. And the name that we give our children does not always reflect who they are going to become. We look at Bible names like Jacob and Esau like John, and we'll talk about his, the meaning of his name again, and other names, such as even Jesus' name himself, and the meaning in those names. Uh, we don't put a whole lot of um, weight into the meaning of names these days. But they did quite a bit. And to have not chosen a family name was very out of the ordinary. To us, the name John is a very well-used name. A lot of people have the name John, uh, and it's just, in fact, a lot of people who get that name John end up going with their middle name because uh, it's the same name that you know, so many other people have. But this was not so for their case. His name was to be John. John means favored of Jehovah, as I mentioned a couple weeks ago. Favored of Jehovah. The Lord hath given grace, and this is what grace is, is the favor of God, the unmerited favor of God. It would have been normal to name him Zacharias, but Elizabeth was clear, no, his name is to be John. And then they look at the dad, certainly, certainly you're not going to go along with it. You guys haven't already discussed this, right? And you're going to give him this random name of John. And they look at him and they make signs to him, you know, is it, what is this kid's name supposed to be? And he gets a writing tablet, probably an iPad, and he begins to type out on his iPad, his name is John. And surprise of all surprises, they're not going to follow tradition here. They're going to go with a different name. And why is it? 
Well, because they had an angel appear to them. And speaking on God's behalf, they were to have a son, and this son was to be named John. And not only that, he was to go on from that day and not just have a unique name, but to go on from that day and live a unique life. He was to go on from that day and, and what appears to be possibly having the vow of a Nazarite to go on and to live a life that was completely sanctified and set apart for service to the Lord for a specific reason. Not to be a pastor of a church, not to be a missionary, but to be a forerunning prophet. A prophet that will open his mouth and speak of things to come. To be a forerunner, which means that he is to precede someone. And that when that someone comes, his job ends. To be the forerunner of the king or of the queen means that you arrive beforehand and you make sure the venue is prepared, you make sure the people are prepared, the menu is prepared, the security is prepared. You are the forerunner. There was a man in the church uh, that I grew up in, and part of his job, um, he was in the Air Force originally, but after a while he became a private contractor, and part of his job was to go to the president's speeches, you know, the, the place where he was going to speak prior to him arriving, and setting up the sound systems. Uh, and setting up the communication systems and all that stuff so that when everybody arrived, the communication system, the sound system, all that stuff was already set up, and that was part of his responsibility. When he wasn't working on military bases, you know, installing various things like that as well, that was part of his responsibility. He was a forerunner, in a sense, in less of a, a um, formal way, though. But when the, when the principal arrives, the forerunner's job is over. So the identity of the baby is to be John. What about the gratitude for the child? Look at verse number 64. John's mouth, I'm sorry, Zacharias' mouth is opened. As soon as he reveals his obedience, his name is John. Zacharias could have had equal lack of faith here. A lack of faith that God would not heal his ability to speak. That whether he names him John or in anger because the fact that his voice was taken from him, he could have said, you know what, I'm going to name him Zacharias anyways. This is what we do. And out of anger and rebellion, he could have said, nope, his name is Zacharias. But instead, he chose to exhibit faith and say his name is John. Immediately, his mouth is open in verse 64. His tongue is loosed, and he spake and praised God. And fear came on all that dwelt round about them. And all these sayings were noised abroad throughout all the hill country of Judea. And all they that heard them laid, them upon their, laid up in their hearts, saying, What manner of child shall this be? And the hand of the Lord was with him. There was great gratitude for the child. He pronounced that he would be John. He gained his voice. Look at how it affected the people around him. Here the parents had acted in faith. They had acted publicly in faith. They didn't just say that his pet name would be John or the name that we would call him around the house would be John, but as far as everybody else was concerned, he would be Zacharias because we don't want to go against tradition. We don't want to uh, ruffle the feathers. No, they said, we will do it exactly as God said. And look at how it affected everybody. Well, first, I want to notice that Zacharias, when he got his voice back, the first thing he did, what would have been the first thing you had, might have done here? Might you have spoken bitter words? I can't believe God has taken my ability to speak away for these nine months. How was I supposed to serve in the, in the temple? How was I supposed to serve as husband and father uh, of you know, my coming child? How was I supposed to do that when you took my voice away from me? All because I had just a, a tiny lack of faith. <laughs> well, to have an angel appear to you and to give that message to you and then to choose not to believe. Look at how it affected the neighbors. It says, fear came on all them that dwelt round about them. What fear? When they saw what happened when Zacharias obeyed God. Because remember when Zacharias came out of the, the holy place, he was unable to speak. He was able to get across to them that he had had some vision, that God had done this. And now they were able to see that he miraculously can speak once more and that God had done this. And that there was something special. Now, it does not tell us exactly in verse 64 what he says, unless what he, said, what, what he says when he praised God in verse 64 is what he actually says is in verses 67 to 80. In verses 67 to 80, uh, you know, Zacharias opens his mouth, and it's almost like we have Zacharias' song, like we had, uh, you know, Mary's song earlier. 
He opens his mouth, and maybe what we read in verse 67 and following is what he opened his mouth and spake. He had nine months to prepare this message, and what he chose to say was to open his mouth and to praise God. And the people around him noticed it. It made a big difference. They noised it abroad throughout all the hill country of Judea, and all they that heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What manner of child shall this be? Man, what kind of child is this going to be? Sometimes you, you meet somebody and, um, you know, they're, they're, they just had a child or whatever, and you get to know uh, the parents maybe. Uh, it's just a very unique situation, you know, and you think, oh, goodness, this child's not going to stand a chance, you know. <laughs> How, what kind of situation has this poor child gotten themselves into? And I know that, you know, the parents are going to love them. Uh, but sometimes we might even think that about our own kids. Oh, this poor kid, you know, <laughs> got my kid to raise them. Uh, you might even think that about my kids. Oh, those poor kids got him, you know. As a dad, uh, they don't stand a chance. You just keep those thoughts to yourself, okay? What kind of child is this going to be? Man, look at the circumstances surrounding his birth. Not only is he born to a priest's family, you know, already he's got the world against him, right? But not only that, the circumstances surrounding his birth, the miraculous taking away of speech from the father and return of it. This child's going to be special. What manner of child shall this be? And the hand of the Lord was with him. But then we look at what Zacharias has to say. And Zacharias' speech here in verses 69 really through 80 is full of praise. And so it ought to be for all of us. Full of praise. He goes back and he begins, first of all, talking about the praise for the promise of David. He talks about fulfillment of prophecy here, and I think that is extraordinarily interesting. I heard a testimony recently of a Jewish person who grew up uh, believing that the New Testament was nothing but basically a handbook for Nazism, uh, that the New Testament was, was all about how to hate Jewish people and why we hate Jewish people and how to kill them. He said he literally grew up believing that about the New Testament. Hey, it's no wonder that many Jewish people, when you, when you begin to talk about the New Testament or quote from it or say that you are a Christian, want to hear nothing from you because many of them have been biased against the Bible in that way. Not the Old Testament scriptures, even though they also believe that our Old Testament scriptures differ from theirs dramatically. When they go and you compare the book of Isaiah to our book of Isaiah, lo and behold, it's the same. That was a surprise to this man whose testimony I heard. It was a surprise as he, he, he read from the Christian Bible and read through Isaiah and saw all the prophecies about Jesus. And so he called his mom. It was back in the 70s. He called his mom and said, can you send me a Hebrew Old Testament? I want to know what the Jewish Old Testament has to say. And he got it, and lo and behold, it said the same thing. It blew his mind. And suddenly he became open to the Word of God and to Jesus Christ as he saw the correlation between the Messiah of the Old Testament and the Messiah of the New Testament being the same person. But he began to talk about the fulfillment of prophecy, even in the birth of John the Baptist as well. Look at verse 67. It says, And his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, And again, I remind you, what happens when the Holy Ghost gets a hold of somebody? What happens when the Holy Spirit gets a hold of somebody? The Word of God is published, and the Son of God is published. That is what happens when the Holy Spirit gets a hold of somebody. You want to be filled with the Spirit? I'm sure we all do. You want to be filled with the Spirit? You walk in obedience, and you walk in faith, and you open your mouth, and you let the Spirit speak through. And I don't mean that in a mystical sense. I don't mean that you open your mouth and somehow, uh, without thinking, you connect to the universe and the universe God speaks through you. And I don't mean anything mystical like that. I mean you open your mouth and you speak the Word of God and you speak about Jesus Christ. This is the Holy Ghost working in you. We go on. Verse 67 again. He was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for He hath visited and redeemed His people and hath raised up an horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. He goes back and he begins to talk about David. What is commonly called the Davidic covenant, where God promised to give Israel a kingdom without end. And some have looked at Israel's history, which would have been future for them, history for us, and said, wait, then God has already broken this covenant because 
You know, there has been generation after generation after generation of Jewish person who did not even have a nation to call their own. Even though now they have a nation, they still don't have a monarchy or a king ruling over them. It was not saying in that promise that there would literally be a king ruling over a literal Jewish nation for all time. What it was referring to was the coming kingdom of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, and that he would be that eternal king. It says back in 2 Samuel 7, 12, this Davidic covenant, And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, this message being given to David, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build in house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men, and with the stripes of the children of men. Did Israel commit iniquity? Yes. Did they get chastened? Yes. Is there a promise here that if they are bad enough, I'll wipe them out? No. Uh, He will chasten them as a father would a children. There's praise for the promise of David. In verse 68, he talks about having visited his people. Uh, The visitation was announced to Mary. Later, the visitation was announced to Joseph, also by the angel Gabriel. He talks about in verse 68 of having redeemed his people. And how will he redeem his people? Is he going to be buying them back from the Babylonians or the Assyrians? Well, that had already occurred uh, by the time um, Luke was written here. It had not occurred by the time of prophecy, you know, to David was written. That is not the redemption he is referring to. He refers to the future redemption of Israel through their Messiah, which we know is Jesus Christ. That was only beginning there to be accomplished with the birth of Jesus. In verse 69, we read about the horn of salvation, most likely here referencing Jesus Christ in His power, and in His majesty, like an animal would raise its horn so that it would begin to charge and to take on its enemy. We see the horn of Israel rising up there, the horn of salvation to come and to bring freedom to all men. We also see about how He delivers Israel from their enemies. Look in verse number 70. As He spake by the mouth of His holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us. I've talked about this before. I remind you again, throughout all of history, there have been many enemies that have tried to completely annihilate Israel from the earth. This was modus operandi of many ancient nations. As they would enter in, they would attempt to completely destroy the bloodline of a nation, either by diluting it or by killing it outright. What would happen with the Babylonians, for example, when they came into Judah? They would try to dilute the bloodline by scattering it all over the empire so that they no longer would have a pure bloodline, in this case of if Jewish folks, in order for them to gather themselves and to fight against uh, their captors. But many have tried to annihilate Israel. The Egyptians tried, the Canaanites tried, the Philistines tried, the Syrians tried, the Assyrians tried, the Babylonians tried, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans... Between the Romans and the Nazis, there were others that came along. Other empires, such as the Ottoman Empire, came along. There was the Nazis in Germany. And even to this day, there are many Muslim nations whose um, vow, written vow, stated vow on video, on audio, it is indisputed, they vow to wipe nation off the earth. And when they say this, they mean every last one of them. When they say from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, they don't mean that they want to bring free and fair elections to the land of Israel and let the Jews and the Muslims and the Christians live side by side. That's not what they mean. What they mean is to wipe every last Jewish person off of that piece of land so that only the Muslim people may live there. And I, you know, there's a, a quarter of Jerusalem that is technically a Christian quarter. Uh, not what we would you know, consider to be Christian. Uh, Armenian is what it is. Uh, an Armenian you know, section of the city of Jerusalem. But I don't think they would even be allowed to stay. There are many Muslim nations surrounding Israel right now that would still wipe them off the face of the earth. This term enemy here that is used in verses 70, or verse 71, it is the Greek word ekthros, which means hostile, hating, and opposing one another. 
hostile, hating. And we have to ask ourselves this question, and you already know the answer to this question, but why would so many people and nations over in the Middle East despise and hate the people of Israel? When the people of Israel, in most cases, have done absolutely nothing to them. Why is it? And it might seem completely illogical and unreasonable. And I've heard some who said, I could probably be an atheist if it were not for the fact of what goes on in Israel. When I see how they are the center of attention in the world and I see where they are located in Scripture, I cannot help but think there must be something to it, to what Scripture has to say concerning them. Behind every nation or movement that has opposed Israel, has been their greatest enemy, Satan himself. Because Satan, like he desires to destroy the church, he desires to completely wipe out the nation of Israel because they are God's chosen people, even if they are not worshiping God right now. Even if they have rejected the Messiah and he has been successful in his bid to get them to reject the Messiah, that was not and is not and will not be enough for him. And so we see even today The hatred against Israel pervades. I check the news a couple times per day. I'm not really all that interested in what's going on with the sparring over the election, but I am waiting to see what Iran does. And I wait to see, are they going to follow through on their threat for another direct attack like they said they would? I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know how bad things will get. We do know, ultimately, that Israel will prevail and that God will preserve them and that he will protect them from their enemies. We have seen, though, in Israel's past, they've been conquered, though, by the Assyrians and the Babylonians, but they could not be destroyed. They were ruled over by the Romans, by the Persians and the Medes, by the Ottomans, but they could not be destroyed. Their land was taken from them and given to others, but they could not be destroyed. Just like the Word of God has been attacked, and many prominent and powerful people have tried to completely destroy and burn every copy of Scripture, it was impossible because they were fighting against God. And it could not be destroyed either. We read in uh, Revelation 12, it says this in Revelation 12, verse 7, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought against his angels. Boy, can you imagine being a fly on the wall for that battle? I can only imagine what that must have looked like. And he prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. This is the dragon and his angels. They couldn't stay in heaven any longer. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And now, out of anger, rebellion, and vengeance against God, he attacks his people, and he attacks the church, and he attacks us. However, deliverance is promised. This deliverance we have a tendency to think of as a, in, in a physical sense, though. A physical deliverance. But do you know what deliverance was actually promised and what deliverance was actually provided? Not just a physical deliverance, but a spiritual deliverance. This is the deliverance that was promised to David. There will be a seed come out of you. This was the deliverance that was promised to Abraham. Beginning in verse number 72, he goes on to talk about that to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham, that he would grant to us that we, being delivered out of the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. The mercy of God was related to the covenants that he had made to Israel. Remember Abraham's willingness to offer up Isaac. God made an oath to Abraham. Zechariah is praising God for his promise to Abraham. He's praising God for his promise to David 
to deliver a Messiah. Zechariah's son is not that Messiah, but his son gets to be the forerunner of the Messiah. What a great blessing. What a blessing to have a child who is going to go and speak on the Messiah's behalf, that is going to go on to serve the Lord, even if that means he does not get the high-paying job, even if it means he does not dwell in the mansion or become a great trader across the Mediterranean Sea, even if it means he dwells in the desert, wears animal skins, and eats wild locust and honey. Even if he does not lead the traditional life, what a great blessing for Zacharias and for Elizabeth that his child would fulfill this promise that was made. The promise to David for a Messiah rested on the promise to Abraham. In Genesis twenty-two sixteen, it says this, And said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son, God speaks to Abraham after he was to offer him as a, a sacrifice in the altar. So you did not withhold thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the, gates of, the gate of his enemies, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed." This wasn't the nation Israel that was to be blessing, a blessing to all nations. This was the Messiah that was to be a blessing to all nations. Why? Because thou hast obeyed my voice. And so he lifts up praise to God. He lifts up praise to God's promise to David, to God's promise to Abraham. And he lifts up praise even for John, his son. Look at verse number 76. He turns his attention now to the child. He says, and thou, child, as he looks at that eight-day-old baby, Thou shalt be called the prophet of the highest. I remind you of something I said back at the very beginning of the study of Luke. There had not been prophets for 400 years. 400 years of silence from God. All they had were the scriptures that had been given to them. But there was no active prophesying or revelation from God to them. And here he gets to look down at that eight-day-old and call that him the prophet of the highest. You know what else that recognizes from Zacharias' standpoint? John's not his. Oh, he, it's his DNA, yes. It's his bloodline. One, yes, absolutely. But John's not his. I think about that all the time when I ask the kids, are, are you my big boy? You know, Colton's my big boy. Carter's my middle boy. And Camden's my baby boy. And if this next child's a boy, I don't know what Camden's going to be because <laughs> I'm running out of adjectives. Um, and I say, are you mine? Are you my little boy? And they'll joke with me and say, no, I'm not your little boy. I'm mommy's little boy. And I was like, oh, you know, we, we growl at him. And, and most of the time, it's like, no, I'm your, mom, I'm your little boy and mommy's little boy and Meemaw's little boy. And you've got to include Meemaw in there, too. But in my heart and in the back of my mind, it's like, but you're not. And I know it, and I don't want to say it, and I don't want to admit it because it kind of hurts a little bit, but you're not. You're the Lord's little boy, the Lord's little girl. Zacharias is acknowledging this. You are the prophet of the highest. For thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. Through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet in the way of peace. After thanking God for these prophecies, he turns his attention to the child, the first prophet that God had sent in 400 years, the forerunner of Jesus Christ, sent to Elizabeth not because she deserved it, to send to Zacharias, not because he was faithful or full of faith, but sent for the purpose of preparing the way of Christ. And so Zacharias praised the message that his son would proclaim. One day when this kid's old enough to talk, he's going to have a message to proclaim to the world. Man, how hard it'd be to sit and wait for that. But that's what this child is going to do one day. And I'm telling you now, that God told me that that is what this child is going to do one day. 
He praised that message, the message that Jesus Christ would come and save the his people from their sin. Spurgeon said this, Depend on it, my hearer. You will never go to heaven unless you are prepared to worship Jesus Christ as God. He talks about the salvation of Jesus here in verses 77 and 78. To give knowledge of salvation unto His people by the remission of their sins through the tender mercy of our God. We see salvation. We see salvation to the people. We see it by the remission, the removing of their sins through the tender mercy of our God. And you know what mercy indicates. It isn't a lack of of transgression, it is a lack of, uh, it is a, a, a withholding of punishment for those transgressions, choosing to show mercy on those who have transgressed. And he talks about the way of salvation in this way. It is to come through the Messiah. In verse 78, through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us. In Matthew 1 21, it says this. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall what? Save his people from their sins. Someone said John was not the Savior. His ministry was to introduce the Savior who would provide redemption for God's people. Likewise, I am not the Savior. Now, I'm not the prophet John. I'm not a prophet. I'm a preacher, and in some cases in Scripture, we see prophets as preachers. I don't prophesy, I don't receive you know, special revelations from God via dreams or uh, you know, angels tapping on my shoulder or anything like that. And if, and if I ever get up in front of you and say that, uh, you can probably discount whatever it is I say next. I have crazy dreams and I'm thankful none of them ha come true uh, because sometimes they are just downright weird. Um, but I'm not a prophet. I'm just a man. But my message is that of John the Baptist. Repent and believe. It is that of John the Baptist. There is a Messiah, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross to save us from our sins, to save His people from their sins, and to save us. There's praise here for the light of Jesus as well, where He talks about the day spring of on high hath visited us to give light to them that sit in darkness, and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. It was a day of very great spiritual darkness. And John the Baptist was sent to point to that light, like it says in Matthew 4, Matthew, uh, 4, 4 verse number 16. The people which sat in darkness saw great light. And to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. In Luke 2 verse number 30 it says this, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. Interesting that the glory of the people of Israel was rejected by the people of Israel. They did not see it as glory, but they tried to destroy it. Someone said this, the people of Israel were sitting in darkness and death and distress gripped them when Jesus came. He brought light, life, and peace. It was the dawn of a new day because of the tender mercies of God. And then we get to the last verse of the chapter, verse number 80. Kind of reminds me of the verse, you know, talking about Jesus. We read a little bit about his childhood and then we just know that he grew in faith, and um, he grew uh, in favor, you know, with God and man. And then we come back to him as an adult. Well, in verse number 80, it says, And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit. <laughs> uh, you ever met a strong-spirited child? <laughs> Apparently, John was one of those strong-spirited children. Very strong, and that has its, had, certainly has its uses. They can be a difficult person to get along with. But they uh, certainly are a very strong axe to chop down the tree, to accomplish the task. It says, and was in the deserts till the days of his showing unto Israel. He spent his early years in the desert until about A.D. 27. It's probable here that his teen years were spent 
investing time and effort into studying the Word of God and into developing his relationship with God. John had a task and a purpose. I don't know exactly how many years John's ministry was, but he prepared for it his whole life. Sometimes we think that if we're going to spend a great amount of time or a great deal of money preparing for something, then we might as well be doing that thing for a long time. John's ministry, though, was not very long-lived, was it? It was very bright and it was very powerful. But then the Messiah came, and then John diminished, and then John was arrested and was imprisoned and was beheaded. John's ministry, all this time he spent out there preparing in the wilderness, did not reflect the longevity of his ministry, but it did reflect the power of his ministry. And I intend to be in the ministry until the day I die. I'd prefer it not be tomorrow, you know, or in the next couple years, Lord willing. I prefer it be a long time from now when I'm like 112 or something like that. But I intend to serve God with the rest of my life, to minister to the Lord with the rest of what He has given to me, the rest of the time, the breath, the strength and energy, the sight, the voice, the hearing that God has given to me. And any one of those things can be taken away at any moment. My intention is to serve the Lord. My temptation is to bide my time, take my time, when it may be God's intention to be strong in spirit and to be filled with the Spirit of the Lord and to have such an intense relationship with God and knowledge of His Scriptures to have a powerful ministry. And I think a powerful ministry is good and it is vital and it doesn't have to be short. Do we want to have a powerful ministry? Do we want to have a powerful church? A powerful church does not have to be short-lived either. A powerful church is to be bright. We're told in Mark 1, 6 that he was clothed with camel's hair and with a girdle of skin about his loins, and he, he did eat locust and wild honey. He did this. Why? Well, one was so that he did not identify with the world the worldliness of the society around him. He wasn't dressing in fine fare, and he wasn't eating the best of the best. Even though he was chosen by the King of all kings, the creator of the universe, he was chosen by God for this task, he did not walk as if he owned the earth. He wandered around in the desert. Frankly, he made it hard to love him. <laughs> he made it hard, to, you know, difficult for people to want to love him and want to follow him. The only thing really endearing about John the Baptist, it would seem, was his message and the fervor that he had in getting it across. No, he did not identify with the worldliness of the day. Instead, he chose to fashion his appearance really after the Old Testament prophets. That was how the Old Testament prophets would dress. They were identifiable by that because they chose not to dress up fancy and to eat fancy and to live fancy. Someone said this, we are not to be isolated in this world, but we are to be insulated, moving in the midst of evil, but untouched by it. You see, an electrician does not have the privilege of being constantly isolated from electricity. If he is, he's not much of an electrician. There are times when an electrician must work close to electricity. And then he trusts in the insulation of his tools, the insulation of the wire that he is using, the insulation of even the shoes, the soles of the shoes that he is wearing. He trusts in that insulation so that he can work close to that power, but that power not touch him. And most electricians throughout their life do get touched by that power, from time to time. Accidents have a tendency to happen. We are to live in this world. We are not to be isolated this from this world, but we are to be insulated in this world so that as we move through it, we are here. We make a difference in it. We leave ripples and waves, but it does not touch us. It ought not to change us. His identity, we read about who he identified as. We read about his courage he was very courageous in his preaching. John, throughout his ministry, he spoke very courageously to the Pharisees and the Sadducees in Matthew 3, as well as to the Roman soldiers. He spoke boldly to them in Luke 3. And we'll talk about that. 
His preaching uh, very strongly rebuked sin. That's a dangerous thing to do sometimes. It stressed the need for repentance. Even America today needs people who will stand up and preach the Word of God with courage and, and identify sin as what it is. Not mincing words, not trying to keep factions within the church happy with Him to avoid trouble, not trying to keep factions even within society happy with Him, but speaking the truth as it is, as the Word of God says it, courageously and boldly. We need Christian men and women in politics and in the pulpit who are willing to speak the truth courageously, to speak what the Bible says, not with a mean and hateful spirit. I see that too much too. Even independent Baptists speaking with mean and hateful spirits. The BBC did a, a, a news segment on the preachers, America's preachers of hate. Or I think it was America's hate preachers. And they came and they looked at two different churches or two different pastors in America, one in Arizona and one in Florida, central Florida, that very, very openly spoke hateful things about, well, for example, the homosexual community that uh, they needed to be destroyed, killed, pushed off the edge of um, the coast, that they needed to be you know, captured and imprisoned and killed and things like that. And of course, the Bible does not teach this at all. You know, as, as Christians, you and I understand that that is not the way that we are to um, be witnesses and testimonies to the lost world around us. But there are those who do think that way. That is not biblical. We need to speak the truth about the Word of God, but not with a mean and a hateful spirit, but with a spirit of love toward them. Because if not by the grace of God, we would be in the same situation. If not by the grace of God, we might lift up our eyes in the brothel. We might lift up our eyes after our latest hit from the drugs or alcohol, that we might lift up our eyes in the bed with somebody new that we've never known before. If not by the grace of God, we might be in the same situation. And so we are to have a heart for those people. John Wesley said, Give me 100 men who hate nothing but sin and love God with all their hearts, and I will shake the world for Christ. As preachers, we take that truth and we preach it unapologetically, but not in a way in which we are trying to attack people with it either. And if we preach it and are true to it unapologetically, it is going to free from some from the chains of bondage. And it is going to anger others to the point where they will want to stop up their ears or stop up my mouth. John Adams said, it is the duty of the clergy to accommodate their discourses to the times, to preach against such sins as are most prevalent, and to recommend such virtues as are most wanted. I don't know if I like the last word he used there, wanted. I would substitute the word needed in there for it. And preachers through time have not, well, many have changed the words of God to fit what society wanted to hear. I know that's not what he's saying here, though. There are certain sins which are more prevalent in certain places and at certain times. And the preachers are to deal with what is going on in the culture around them. I think it's completely appropriate to preach from the Word of God about things that are going on around us, about events that are occurring around us. Why? Because we as Christians need to, be, we need to know how to respond in those times. And to learn what the Word of God has to say about those things. But then we see also about the humility of John the Baptist. Some people estimate that there were nearly 300,000 people that were baptized during the ministry of John the Baptist, but yet John remained humble. When Jesus came, he spoke of a Messiah who was to come, whose shoes he was not even worthy to unlatch. Can you imagine a preacher with a, at a mega church with 300,000 people saying something like that? A preacher at a megachurch who had gotten used to gold wristwatches. I remember watching 
there was a, a, a student of mine, or some students of mine, who went to a church in the area down in Fort Lauderdale, and they said, oh yeah, we go to this church, this is my pastor. And so I looked him up and found, you know, social media accounts, and I was watching the videos he was posting, and he was posting videos in his closet, and you know what his backdrop was from his closet? It was his Air Jordan collection. Uh, and I mean, we're talking, these shoes are hundreds of dollars each. And he has a wall full of them in this nice, you know, cubbies that he has each of them stored in so he can show them off. That's his backdrop for his videos. You know, why choose your closet? Well, I, I understand closets are one of the quietest places to record audio. Uh, if you don't have a recording studio, closet's a great place to go to. Uh, but I'm pretty sure his backdrop was what it was on purpose. I remember hearing another preacher uh, scolding his congregation because he did not have a $10,000 Rolex. Now, it might not have been a Rolex, but it was a $10,000 watch, whatever it was. And he was saying, you know, because, you, because of you and your faithfulness, I've been able to get this and this and this, but I, what's wrong with you if your preacher cannot have this $10,000 watch? What's wrong with you? You're not being faithful enough. <laughs> Can you imagine if I were to get up and to preach a sermon scolding you because I couldn't drive a Porsche around or something like that? I don't think I would last very long here <laughs> if, if I started preaching those kinds of sermons. Can you imagine a, a mega church preacher who's gotten used to the gold watches and the fancy cars and the jets and the fine you know, homes all across the country, the lakefront and the beachfront homes that they can go to? Can you imagine them saying, oh, here comes Jesus. He must increase, I must decrease. It's not usually the way it works out, though, is it? When you begin to get those things, you begin to want more of them, and nothing can cause you to lose your grip on that. There is no humility there. It is, I will say whatever I need to to keep my position. I'll say whatever I need to to keep the money flowing. This was not John the Baptist, though. When his followers began to leave him to follow after Jesus, John the Baptist accepted that as necessary, remaining humble. John 3, 27 says, John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. And in verse number 30, he says, He must increase, but I must decrease. A.W. Tozer said, The most critical need of the church at this moment is men, bold men, free men. The church must seek in prayer and much humility the coming again of men made of the stuff of which prophets and martyrs are made. And F.B. Meyer said the only hope of a decreasing self is an increasing God. And so John the Baptist, a man who was sent from God, a man who understood his purpose, a man who separated himself from the things of the world, so that he could fulfill that purpose and point others to Jesus. A man who would not allow culture to sway him, but a man who stood resolute even when culture threatened to bend and ultimately destroyed him and killed him. But he never broke. He never gave in. He chose to live out the purpose that God had given to him. And his purpose, in one sense, is the same purpose that was given to you and to me. We are called to be separate from the world. We are called to courageously speak to others about Jesus Christ. And we are called to humbly point others to Him. Because He is the only one who can bring about salvation. It isn't join the church, get baptized, do your best to change your life, to make things right. That is not the means of salvation. Those things are things that, that, that man does but it begins its salvation, and then God does those works through us. We have the same, in a sense, the same purpose that John the Baptist had, to point others to Jesus Christ in a humble way, because he alone can give salvation. How are you doing in fulfilling your purpose? Now, I don't expect you all to come to church Sunday, or I guess Wednesday night, in camel hair. And please don't bring me any locust. I don't intend to eat any of them. Honey sounds great. Bring me some honey. We use lots of honey in our household. But um, I have no intention of dressing like, you know, in camel hair. Um, although we do have a camel hair blanket or towel or something that, they, that Rachel got from Tunisia, I think. 
apparently it doesn't burn, but uh, we do have that, but I don't intend to dress in camel hair. It, sound, it, it feels pretty itchy to me. But apart from that, how are you doing with being like John the Baptist? Humbly pointing others to Christ. Making that your purpose in life. Your, your main purpose in life, among other things. Well, let's close here in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we do thank you once more for bringing us out tonight. We thank you for the sunshine we thank you for the sprinkles that I guess only Becky got today. We thank you for uh, this uh, Sunday, this Lord's Day you've given to us to be in your house. And Lord, I pray that you'd put your hand of blessing upon our evening and upon our week. I pray, Lord, again, as I pray every week, that you would help us to be lights and testimonies like John the Baptist, humbly pointing towards you and away from ourselves. Humbly pointing towards you when people ask why we're happy when people ask how it is we have hope, when people ask why it is we can joy during sorrowful times, that we can just simply point the finger to you. Because it's something that you alone have and can give to anybody who seeks it out. And Lord, I ask that uh, you would help us to, be, to have that same ministry, in a sense, that John the Baptist had. Lord, I pray for physical healing for those that are not well and for, for protection from illness for those that are being subjected to it. I pray that you bring us back together again for Bible study this Wednesday, Lord, safe and sound. And we ask all of these things in your son's name I pray. Amen.